Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. We're going to start off today's show by discussing, as many are in the media around the world, that interview that was given by Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And we're going to hone in on one specific aspect of that. And of course, the discussion of racism has been coming up ever since that interview and even before, certainly when it comes to the, the monarchy in the UK. We now have anti-racism campaigners in the UK who are calling for the royal household to be brought within the rules of the Equality Act in the UK. And now, of course, the Equality Act, as its name suggests, um, it protects people from discrimination within the workplace and, of course, within the wider society as well in the public sphere. Um, the royal household at this point in time is exempt from those rules. Um, and we're going to try to then discuss that aspect of the entire Harry and Meghan um, crisis, if I may use that term, uh, when it comes to the royals in the UK. Uh, let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're now joined by Dr. Anna Whitelock, who is a professor of the history of monarchy at Royal Holloway at the University of London. She's joining us today from Cambridge. And joining us today from London is Nadifa Mohammed, who is a novelist. She's a Somali-British. She's also been featured on Granta Mag's, magazine's pardon me, list of the British best of young British novelists. Pardon me. Um, she is joining us, as I said, from the British capital. Nadifa and Anna, thank you both for taking our time out of your busy schedules to join us here in Scope today. Uh, Nadifa, I'd like to start with you. Um, what does it say to you that the royal family is exempt from the Equality Act altogether? I mean, you would think that that sends the wrong message to society altogether, doesn't it? Yes, they're not the only one who have, uh, the only institution, British institution, that's been either late or still not um, assigned to the Equalities Act. So the police were also given an exemption for a long time. And I think this has caused long-term problems where their discrimination was seen as justified and I don't think that the discrimination of the royal family within the royal family has been aimed at people from uh, the rest of the world. It's been very local concerns about Catholic people and um, various other concerns. So to me, we have to focus on the historical reasons for why they were given these exemptions and what's the solution for those issues at the moment. Hmm. Anna, what are your thoughts on that? Because we've also had uh, Prince William, of course, coming out and saying that the, the royal family is not racist. And of course, I don't want to presume things. I mean, uh, uh, of course, I'm on the outside. But what are your thoughts about this as somebody who has, who has studied closely the monarchy? I think it's important to be clear about what we're talking about here, um, because obviously the, the royal family is distinct from the royal household as an institution, um, which is about the working body that is the, the palace. And so this question about the equality law is about um, the behaviour and the practices within the royal household and therefore suggestions that, um, you know, mental health wasn't treated properly, uh, stress and all of that kind of thing wasn't handled properly by the royal household and the palace. Um, and of course, suggestions of, of racism underlining and underpinning the treatment of Meghan. Of course, that's distinct from the royal family. Um, the royal family is a family like other families, albeit a very particular one. Um, and so that the question about le equality legislation um, is not directly related to the royal family per se, it's about the royal household. Mm. More generally, of course, we saw yesterday William having to, you know, make the unprecedented remark, you know, my family are not racist at all. Um, the statement from the palace earlier in the week was all about trying to make this a family matter, one that they would deal with behind closed doors. But of course, as was shown yesterday, they are not a private family. And this has become a global story. And people want to see change. Um, I don't think they're going to see it very soon. This is about attitudes that have been uh, bedded in over, over a long period, I'm sure, within the royal family. And so conversations will be going on behind palace doors. I don't think we're going to get the kind of obvious signs of change, certainly in the short term, um, which perhaps the media and many people in the public would want to see. Hmm. All right, so Nadifa, I, I know that for, for many Britons, uh, the royal family or, or royal household, and, and Anna, I appreciate, of course, you clarifying that for myself and viewers about the, you know, the two distinctions between those terms. Um, but Nadifa, in your opinion, um, do you think that Britons will very much still stick behind the monarchy? I know that that has been in the past a sensitive topic of criticism at, at times. I think that there's no real consensus. There's a fork in the road, I think, for the royal family where 
modernizers, younger generation of um, Britons do want change, while other people want them to be as close to an imagined ideal of Britishness in a very old fashioned traditional version of Britishness. So I, I don't know how they will go and I don't know how they will decide because things that have been acceptable for them in the past, and I understand um, Dr. Whitelock's um, distinction between the Equalities Act within the royal household and within the royal family, but within the royal family itself, we've also had a sense that they are distinct from other people, whether they marry, um, whether they're able to marry commoners, which I think they did for the first time with Catherine Middleton, and just a sense of um, a very small slice of Britain ruling Britain. Mm. And this, I, and I don't want to, you know, just stick to the, the story of Harry and Meghan because this obviously goes to a larger issue, right? I mean, we have had concerns, and again, it's not just limited to the UK either. I mean, it's it's um, Europe wide also, where there is growing xenophobia, right? And of course, the context of that is probably different, and we can argue about the context of that, be it Brexit or or you know uh, the pandemic, etc. But um, do you think that this all plays into that? This is just uh, the timing is really, really bad. I.e., this looks really bad on the royal household slash family as well at this time and that they probably do need to do something a lot more concrete than they have done so far i mean i think it certainly does clearly play to wider divisions uh, in society um you know strains of, of uh, racism and and you know the xenophobia and so on that we've seen as a result of brexit i mean i think this is particular this is about um a mixed race woman marrying into the royal family um and the very particular situation that that presents i mean the problem here of course is that the monarchy itself as an institution is uh, age old it, it's you know founded on uh basically white privilege it's about um you know inherited white privilege given by birth not by merit um, it's an institution that in many ways is completely outdated. And the question I think will be raised after uh, the Queen is no longer with us, you know, what is the monarchy? What is it for? Who does it represent? Do people want it? And of course, the Queen is head of state in 15 countries besides the UK, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and nine countries in the Caribbean. So they too have to consider their attitude and relationship with the British monarchy. So I think there's going to be a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. Much of that discussion has been sort of held in check by sort of respect for, for the Queen and the sense that her reign, you know, will not last indefinitely. Um, and so it's been on pause, but this week has shown how contentious an issue, um, not just the royal family and comments that have been made, but clearly the monarchy more generally and whether it's sort of fit for, for purpose in the 21st century. And although the royal family and the monarchy have made steps to modernise, you know, the focus on on mental health in terms of their, their speaking out, Harry and uh, William. Mm. They're much more sort of touchy-feely with people. They talk a lot more to, about their emotions. Still, yeah. the institution is not arguably, you know, fit for the 21st century when ideas of equality are so important. You know, one of the things that always strikes me is is the question of moral authority, right? Um, a lot of us around the world are told to look up to the likes of the UK and, of course, other countries as well. And that's not to say that every country doesn't have its own respective issues. But then um, this then puts into question that whole narrative of moral authority over others, doesn't it? I think that idea is very dangerous. And as people have been saying this week, the relationship between the royal family and the, and the history of Britain, whether that's slavery, colonialism, the, the, the looted um, valuables that were taken from the subcontinent and Africa and beyond. All of this hasn't really been openly discussed, I think, in the same way until now. And one of the things that I think Meghan has done is that she's allowed a much franker discussion because she's not abiding by the same rules as um, people did in this still very feudal system, I think. Hmm. Uh, we're quickly running, running out of time, Anna, so I'm just going to give you the final word before I let both of you go. Um, on that point, then, of how the world 
moves and sees this, right? Um, uh, I, I, all those countries that you listed, Anna, who have and who currently have the queen as the head of state, do you think that a lot of them will be revisiting that? I mean, I know, I know that's probably very drastic to imagine that any of those countries will probably walk away from the queen altogether, but do you think that there is a question of, hey, is this even working for us? It's drastic at all. I mean, uh, certainly Barbados already has announced the fact that they intend to uh, break ties with the monarchy. There's various bits of polling in New Zealand, Australia, which, you know, suggests that it's, you know, evenly split or even tilting towards uh, rethinking the relationship with the monarchy. So absolutely, I think these will be uh, questions and debates that are had. And maybe uh, after the death of the Queen, we will see, like Barbados, countries coming out and saying, actually, you know, we've had, you know, we've had our time and now it's uh, it's the appropriate moment for an elected head of state. Right, we'll leave it there at that, but I think we got through quite a bit of very pertinent um, content. We appreciate both Nadifa and Anna for sharing their expertise with us and for speaking to us respectively from London and Cambridge. We were discussing there, of course, the Equality Act and the fact that the royal family is exempt from rules within the Equality Act, as Nadifa there um, clarified for us. It's not just the royal family which is exempt from the Equality Act, but nevertheless, it's it's an important, important um, system and structure, that an institution that is exempt from that Equality the act and should probably be brought into line with that, especially in line of what's just happened over the past number of days ever since that, that Oprah interview took place. Um, then there's, of course, the, the macro discussion about xenophobia as a whole within Europe, xenophobia and racism within the entire colonial structure. And that then goes back to the entire history of the British Empire and, you know, where I'm sitting or, you know, those other countries where the Queen is still very much the head of state. Um, how will they now be viewing the royal family and its quote-unquote moral authority as we've all uh, been convinced in some ways to accept uh, around the world. I'll be back with our next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. Now, in this segment, we're going to discuss a leaked U.S. State Department document, which has laid out the Biden administration's case for what Afghanistan's governing system, essentially, if I may put it that way, um, should look like, at least in an interim period, till there is a more permanent solution for then a U.S. withdrawal to be able to take place. Now, it goes into greater detail, a lot greater detail than what Donald Trump had uh, ever already spoken of uh, during his tenure, at least publicly, of course. Um, it speaks about, you know, suggested structure of the government. In some instances, it even goes into such specific details, such as the number of people on specific councils and commissions as well. Um, and overall, the document calls for the current government, i.e. the Kabul government, that is, to be replaced with a temporary um, government with a new constitution to be drafted as well and a ceasefire to be brought into place. Um, will this make the May 1st deadline that was set by Donald Trump? Trump viable. Um, that is what I'll, that is a question I'll put now to my guests who are joining us today. We're now joined by Dr. Gordon Adams, who is a distinguished fellow at the Quincy Institute. He's also a professor emeritus at the School of International Service at the American University. He's joining us today from Brunswick in Maine. Joining us this morning from Ottawa, Ontario in Canada is Irfan Yar, who is a research fellow at the Global Counterterrorism Institute. Irfan and Gordon, good morning to you both and thank you for joining us today here in Scope. Um, Gordon, let me start with you. What do you make of the State Department? Department document, uh, as I said, a lot more detailed than what we've seen previously vis-a-vis uh, -vis the U.S. Uh, policies towards a more permanent solution in Afghanistan. Will this make May 1st um, viable? I don't think the outcome here is really going to be determined by um, a, a document that the State Department and the administration uh, may have drafted. Um, there are a lot of interesting provisions in that document. But the real question is, uh, do the do the Afghan government and does the Taliban want to agree to any type of document of this kind? I mean, it is an interesting document because it has a lot of vast detail about setting up shuras and setting up uh, judicial bodies and a religious law interpretation body and so on. There's an, a, lot, a vast amount of detail. But really, the outcome of this conflict and the May 1 deadline are going to be determined by political relationships between the United States, the Afghan government, and the Taliban. Uh, and the particularities of a document, I think, are not going to be decisive here. So, Erfan, tell us, um, what, are, what are your thoughts about this document at this time? I mean, will this be... The, the push that will push Kabul, the Kabul government, i.e. the Ghani government and the Taliban, to finally talk to each other? Uh, 
the, the recent letter that was sent along this proposal, you know, uh, suggested the Biden administration is extremely frustrated with the slow and pokey and to Afghan peace process. And therefore, you know, it strongly urged both the Afghan and, and the Taliban, you know, to uh, to come to a mutual agreement. But uh, I agree with my colleague, you know, he's right that it would totally depend on the on the Taliban and the Afghan government. But uh, I think it's, it's more likely that the Taliban will accept this agreement and the Afghan government because it will, you know, shake the status quo, uh, especially for Amrullah Saleh and Ashraf Ghani, and they are very less likely to accept this agreement. Okay, so um, let's discuss this further then, if we, if we can then, Gordon. If we're looking at, for example, specific numbers of people on councils and commissions, I mean, I wonder if do you think that there is a certain amount of overreach or possibly on the part of the Americans? I'm not terribly surprised that the United States has tried to draft this kind of document and put it in front of the parties. And I think my colleague is right uh, that the Afghan government is likely to be uneasy with this document because they'd rather be in place with the government they have and integrate the Taliban into that government. Uh, the likelihood of that, I think, is extremely low. Right now, the, the relationship of forces in Afghanistan totally favors the Taliban uh, and not the Afghan government. So my sense is this is it's a matter of time that the Taliban are in a position to write pretty much their own terms for what kind of government succeeds the current Afghan government. And the Afghan government neither holds the territory nor at this point the military strength to have that kind of impact. There's a there's a kind of an almost deja vu feeling about this. Uh, it's been proposed uh, back at the beginning in 2001, 2002, some kind of government structure. Now another government structure is proposed. But really, it's the, it's the balance of forces on the ground that are going to determine the outcome here. It's a kind of, a, we, we call this a Hail Mary pass in the United States. The American game of football is a Hail Mary pass is when you throw a very long pass downfield and just hope that somebody will catch it. Yeah. And this agreement, uh, this uh, draft uh, statement uh, looks very much like a Hail Mary pass to try to pull a very weak position out of the fire and try to make it work. I don't expect much to come out of it. And even if the Taliban agreed to it, it's not clear that the Afghani government will agree to it. Uh, and even if either both sides agree to it, what is going to determine the future structure of the government will be the relation of forces on the ground and not the words in any particular document. Okay, Sir Afana, I wonder, um, as, as Gordon there correctly pointed out, it is about the reality on the ground, right? It's, it's about who is stronger uh, at this point in time. And um, do you think that after all these years, the reality is that the Taliban is still very strong, as pretty much we see? And then what does that then mean for future governance in Afghanistan? Well, uh, you know, Again, if we refer to the letter, the Antony has strongly urged both the Taliban and Afghan government, you know, to positively consider it. And he told the president straight from the shoulder that once the U.S. soldier leave Afghanistan, and if there is no reconciliation with the group, the security situation will deteriorate, and the Taliban will most probably come to power. So it's kind of, you know, warning in a diplomatic tone to the Afghan government that uh, the Taliban are, you know, coming later or soon. So obviously both, you know, on the table and, uh, and the battlefield, the Taliban are having upper hands. But despite all these things, you know, there are certain elements within the Afghan government, I would call them the spoilers, you know, that they do not want the Taliban to come back to power. Because if they come to power, it is very less likely that, uh, you know, they will uh, achieve their own personal interests. So because of their, you know, realistically speaking, because of their own personal ambitions, they want to keep the Taliban away from, you know, joining the Afghan government. Hmm. But then I would think, Gordon, that the, the, the American interest here, and it's an obvious one, is this, this, is this forever war um, will only be that much longer if the May 1st deadline is not heated and, and the Americans very much remain on the ground. I mean, then uh, the end is not even in sight then at that, point, at that time? 
Uh, I think it's possible that this may drag on some, and I certainly see signs in the American administration that the desire here is to continue to drag things on. You know, this is a hardy perennial of the United States in Afghanistan uh, over several administrations who've come into office dedicated to the proposition of either victory or departure. Uh, and the, situ on the situation on the ground continues to erode. I mean, right now there are uh, 12,500 NATO troops in Afghanistan training the Afghan, uh, Afghani government military and police forces, not terribly successfully, according to our own uh, Afghan uh, Reconstruction Review Group here in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, there are, uh, in addition to that, 2,500 American troops who have not lost a life in over a year because that was the original agreement with the Taliban. They would not focus on the American forces. But it's not clear that those that's enough pe personnel to make any kind of a difference militarily. The other NATO forces are not going to engage much on the military terms. And you've got another 18,000 contractors to the government of Afghanistan or to the United States government providing advice and training and services in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, all in, all told, that's something like 30 to 35,000 people who need to be moved out by May 1st if the United States government decides it's going to leave. Mm -hmm. With a new administration in place, I see the American administration trying to delay that departure. Uh, I don't see them delay in delaying it, improving the military situation for the Afghani government on the ground. That seems to have deteriorated uh, extremely a, a long distance. So in a way, this is what I would call a no drama or a shadow play. Uh, we're, we're working on what departure might look like uh, that looks pretty to all of the parties. But in the end, the Taliban holds the upper hand here. It reminds me very much of the end of the war in Vietnam for the United States, yeah. where there were all kinds of proposals about constitution and joint government and things that might work out between the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, mm. uh, the, the Republic of Vietnam in the South, none of which really were more than pieces of paper, right. because once the American forces had left, the situation on the ground was what prevailed. So, you know, Irfan, on, on that point then about continuous external involvement, right, um, in Afghanistan. I would think that any uh, any citizen of the country would want um, their country's sovereignty to be preserved and then for, for things to move along in a fashion where it is Afghans making decisions for Afghanistan themselves. Um, is that point coming even in the near future or is that very far off right now? Yes, uh, absolutely. This point is very clear that Afghans want to determine their own future. And even in the proposed plan, we will see that it, uh, you know, it keeps the fundamental values and the principle of Afghanistan. For example, it says that the Islam will remain the official religion of the state. It also, you know, uh, protect the, the, the national sovereignty and, uh, and the territorial integrity of Afghanistan. Of course, it also, you know, says that uh, the women, women right would be protected. But there are certain, you know, controversies. For example, the Taliban do not accept the current constitution of Afghanistan and demand that uh, it must be replaced by a new legal document. But for the Afghan government, this is kind of a red line. And uh, if we, you know, look uh, at the, 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 second, uh, the second part of this proposed, this strike a very good balance between the two parties because it takes the 2004 constitution as a base and the basic, you know, template for the new constitution from which it will be, it will be, you know, drafted. And I think if the current Afghan leadership were and the Taliban choose uh, they would understand that the Taliban demand to change the constitution is legitimate because, you know, no matter how good the current constitution is, no matter how, you know, religious the current constitution is, after all, it was drafted by those who won the war. So obviously, Taliban are not going to accept this, you know, this constitution. And again, if you look from the Taliban perspective, it is not irrational, you know, to reject this this constitution and advocate for for a new one which is acceptable to both the parties. And the second controversial point, you know, arises from the Taliban demand to dissolve and break up the current Afghan government, which Ashraf Ghani and his team has, you know, at time rejected mm. uh, outrightly. And this is that any transition must be, you know, taking place, you know, through a democratic peace process. But I think given the situation, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, neither the Taliban will agree that uh, an election is reheld and, you know, elect a uh, state up ahead. 
So right. it, it is, you know, yeah. So until these two uh, controversies are solved, they are not coming to an agreement. Okay, we'll have to leave those as a final comment, but we appreciate both Gordon and Irfan for taking their time out uh, this morning for sharing their expertise with us. That was Irfan who was speaking to us from Ottawa and Gordon was speaking to us from Brunswick in Maine. Both of them sharing their expertise about this U.S. State Department um, document, which has been leaked about essentially uh, the structure of uh, an interim Afghan government, about even details down to, as I said in my introduction, number of people on councils and commissions. I mean, that sounds like a tad bit of an overreach really for any external uh, player in Afghanistan to be making. Those decisions should very much be in, in any Afghan government's hands, which is elected by the people of Afghanistan themselves, right? So one wonders where, when and if we will be reaching that point at any point in the near future where this entire process will then be just in the hands of Afghans, be they the Taliban or the Kabul government uh, sitting around the table, uh, hopefully discussing things in a peaceful fashion um, for the benefit of the Afghan people themselves. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Okar Rizvi. Now, in this final segment of today's show, we're going to discuss um, COVID-19 vaccines. And that has, of course, been something that's been debated for quite a while now. And we've discussed that a number of times on this show as well. But now we've had a, about 100 plus nations um, calling on the WTO, the World Trade Organization, to temporarily waive patents for COVID-19 vaccines so that uh, countries that, are, that have so far been prevented from immunizing their people uh, from this virus can then do so. We've also had in the U.S. 400 plus organizations pressuring the Biden administration to allow for a waiver on patents and even um, 115, I believe, organizations have also urged the EU to lift um, and to um, to ever to at this point in time at least drop its opposition to the suspension of these patents as well now of course this is a this is a sensitive issue in the sense that a lot of these countries say that pharmaceutical companies need to have that sort of push and drive to be making money to then produce these vaccines but on the other hand we of course have the very real argument that if everyone's not vaccinated we will have more and more variants coming up and it'll be that much harder for the rest of the world to move on then from this virus back to normal life let's discuss all of those issues a bit further. We're not joined by Massimo Florio, who is a professor of public economics at the University of Milan. He is joining us today from Milan. Joining us this morning from Boston is Brooke Baker, who is a senior policy analyst with Health Global Access Project. He's also an honorary research fellow at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Brooke and Massimo, thank you both for taking our time out to join us today here in Scope. Uh, Brooke, if I may, I'd like to start with you. Um, wh where do you lie on this argument about patents when it comes to the COVID 19 vaccines? I think it's critical that this waiver be supported by all countries. Um, and it's not just pa uh, patents. It, it's also the, the waiver addresses trade secrets, copyrights, and industrial designs, all of which are embedded in a, a great number of COVID-related medical technologies. And, and the right holders, the, the, the companies that own these intellectual property rights, because of their uh, ownership, get to have exclusive control over uh, supply, price, and distribution. And what we see as a consequence is artificially restricted supply that cannot possibly meet the needs of the global population. We have prices which are result in profiteering where uh, two of the major producers, one's, uh, one's scheduled to make $18 billion a year, the, the other uh, 15 to $30 billion a year. And we see grossly inequitable distribution, where uh, out of 300 uh, million doses that have been uh, administered in 10 rich, mostly in 10 rich countries, 80% in 10 rich countries, most of the world's population has received uh, nothing in their country yet. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, only uh, less than three million doses have been delivered to uh, all other low and middle income countries. Simo, you know, the argument on the other side, as I said in my introduction, would be, listen, a, a lot of effort and time, I mean, you know, in context, of course, has gone into producing these vaccines. So who then pays for that? Well, in an economic perspective, the, 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 the current situation is, uh, uh, in, is, in a sense, is crazy because uh, um, billions of uh, taxpayers' money um, have been uh, disbursed by governments, uh, both uh, um, in the research st step uh, for the vaccines uh, and um, 
and later on with uh, advanced payments for contracts uh, even be before the, there was an approval by the pharmaceutical agencies. So in fact, uh, what we are discussing here is uh, uh, how to use uh, uh, public money in the most uh, efficient uh, way. Uh, the, the current uh, mechanism is uh, certainly uh, not uh, not uh, efficient. Um, it, it is taking uh, too much time uh, to get the uh, <clears throat> to the, get the vaccines uh, to the to the to everybody. In fact, in in, in the planet, and um, and this is very very risky. We we need an alternative. Hmm. All right. So, Brooke, then, um, what should do you think happen next? So, we we waive the waivers. We we waive the waiver. Pardon me on the patent, and then these countries start producing uh, the vaccines. Um, will that, in and of itself, overnight resolve the issue? Because then, I would think that there are still very real world issues about distribution as well. Which, I mean, I know, respectively, each country can probably figure it out on their own. But then, there are some countries who would still have a disadvantage in that case. Yeah, that, nothing would happen overnight. Um, you know, once the waiver is passed, and we would in fact also need to have action at the at the country level. Countries would have to operationalize the waiver into their own national law and take steps to allow other producers to produce. And and frankly, what we need here is is something we would call deep technology transfer, especially for the vaccines. Those are complex products to uh, to manufacture. Uh, it would take many, uh, many existing plants some time, a matter of months, not years, but months at least, uh, to to learn how to uh, make make the vaccine and and also bring that manufacturer up to scale. Uh, it would be highly preferable if the companies could be forced to cooperate with that technology transfer. Um, and if if rich countries and uh, and development banks would invest in helping to repurpose and build uh, additional capacity in low and middle income countries, that's needed. Uh, but even if it's going to take a matter of months, that's better than years because the current pace of production uh, and supply to uh, low and middle income countries will result in many of those countries not receiving adequate supplies until 2023 or even 2024. If that happens, we can be certain that new variants will arise, that previous immunizations may be ineffective to prevent uh, disease from those variants, and that coronavirus will recircle the world again. When it recircles the world again, the same vicious cycle of rich countries running to the front of the line to uh, to amass huge stockpiles of, of uh, vaccine, way more than is needed for their own country's population, will continue the next time and then the time after that. So we have to s solve this problem by having a, a massive a sustainable increase in manufacturing capacity that should be distributed globally and governments and ultimately companies have to be brought to the table to uh, support and, and invest in that uh, in industrialization of pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity uh, hmm. on a regional basis much more broadly around the globe. Massimo, you're sitting in, in, in Europe. Um, the EU is still, at this point in time, has not, of course, agreed to, to lift even temporarily any waiver on such patents of vaccines. What do you think is holding it back? I mean, is it is it the fact that, you know, uh, companies have so far always, of course, I mean, logically, and at least in today's global economy, have always prioritized profit over everything else. Do you think that um, the push for, if I may use this phrase, a more humane approach is possibly a step too far? Yes, I think that uh, the, the reason why the European uh, Commission, which is the executive body of the European Union, um, uh, has not has not joined countries such as South Africa or India in the negotiation at the World Trade Organization to uh, lift um, temporarily the patents is uh, for a, a bad argument. The, the bad argument is that um, if we do that now, uh, this will discourage uh, the uh, the companies in future to invest uh, in, uh, in in research because, in a sense, they will be expropriated. They will be expropriated uh, from uh, the, the the results of uh, the profits uh, coming on from 
the research. But this is a, a, a wrong argument for two reasons. The, the first one is that most of the research is not done currently in the big pharma themselves. It, it is done elsewhere, um, either in, uh, in uh, smaller scale uh, laboratories, uh, startups, uh, uh, and in a number of uh, uh, universities and not-for-profit not organizations. And second, because of the flows of money from the taxpayers to these, uh, these companies. So I, uh, I, I think that uh, this argument uh, of innovation that would be discouraged in future uh, by uh, uh, lifting uh, the, 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 the current arrangements uh, around the the patents is is a wrong argument most of innovation currently is uh, is done elsewhere and most of it with uh, a lot of public money all right so we're running out of time so brooke i wanted to give you the final word before i let both of you go um if we're looking at how the richer countries have acted, right? So we've, we've had um, a number of times the WHO had, um, as well as the UN Secretary General, condemning um, what's being called vaccine nationalism, right? Or hoarding vaccines. I mean, I believe the Canadians a while back, the, the, the estimate was that they, were ha they, were, or they had ordered five times the amount of vaccines that they actually needed for each person within Canada. But I imagine possibly that may be the case in the US. I don't remember the exact statistics there, but um, can we then expect such countries to then be okay with waiving the patent. I mean, it seems that their priorities, and again, logically, of course, and rightfully, their own population, but then uh, it seems that the rest of the world is sort of just like, you know, on their own. Well, uh, we we might well call what's happening vaccine apartheid because it's it's not just uh, nationalism is, is too kind a word because the consequence of this is is grotesque separation of people from vaccines and therefore from the life-saving invention uh, that will prevent deaths. But... Uh, I, I think it's becoming increasingly clear that a policy that says, well, we're going to take care of our people only. Uh, in the U.S., the, uh, President Trump's former policy of U.S. first and U.S. only simply cannot work. This virus will recirculate. Uh, it will mutate. And it already is. And we're already seeing that some of the initial vaccines and some of the initial monoclonal antibodies are not effective in treating some of the new variants or not as effective. And those variants are going to continue in, in populations that become infected and, and uh, where infections are not prevented by vaccination. Uh, the more people that get infected and the longer they get infected, the more opportunity there is for this virus to mutate into previously untreated forms. And, and so the rich countries may think, well, we'll treat our population and we'll be fine. But what happens when a new variant comes uh, and the vaccinations do not protect against a new variant? We will have exactly the same kind of wave of infection, uh, economic uh, shutdown, uh, suspension of social life that we've seen this time around. Yeah. And we'll have to have a new scale up of manufacturing. So it's not in the rich country's interest to let anyone go unvaccinated. Indeed, we'll have to leave there as a final comment. We appreciate both Brooke and Massimo for taking their time out of their busy schedules to, to speak with us and to share their thoughts with us about um, this issue of vaccine patents, right, when it comes to the coronavirus. Um, this is, uh, you know, an extraordinary situation. And uh, we possibly and actually do need to convince these companies that at this point it's not profits over human rights and a humane approach, but it's actually in the interest, even economically, really, as, as Brooke there mentioned, and Massimo had also contextualized for us, um, it's bad for the economy to still have the coronavirus out there in any country, because then the variant may very well come back to haunt you and your own respective uh, populace as well. If it again circulates, then you need to shut down your economy all over again. So it's, it's high time that we have all these rich nations realizing that just by hoarding and by prioritizing just their own population. This will simply not be good for them themselves as well, if we're even just looking at very selfish policy altogether. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.